first one to go to Steve Rhodes. It's my pleasure to be having Steve Rhodes as uh, um, a guest. And how are you, Steve? Nice to be with uh, you. Good. Good to get to, good to hear your voice. Ah, great, great, great. Hey, I thought what we would do today, make the case, both sides of the case, the case for the Bulls and the uh, Bears. So let's begin with the uh, Bears case as far as my outlook for the market and what things uh, and the reasons why. And, and the first okay. reason, the first reason, Basil, is because when I take a look at the yearly chart for the S&P 500, that's what we have up on the screen here, it has what I refer to as a TD9 count top. And uh, you don't get these that often, uh, but the TD9 count tops work the same way no matter what time frame it is, whether it's a yearly, a five minute, a daily. And so we've got that topping signal, which at this stage here has taken hold. So that's the first element. The second element is I step down from a yearly chart and go take a look at a monthly chart. The monthly chart for the S&P 500 has a TD9 count top as well, so much like the uh, yearly does. And uh, with 37.2334 being its downside price target. And what's nice about this TD9 count system is it provides us with an objective level to help identify support or resistance or where price broke out from. So on a monthly basis, the S&P breakout level is 37.23. And as long as price remains below this green line, I refer to that as the oscillator and change line, that still is a potential. So that's item number two. Number three, the weekly chart for the S&P 500 has a Rhodes momentum indicator top. I also have it as wave number seven. So that's your letter G, part of your rogue wave. So we've got those two tops that formed at the high. Now, what happened here in the weekly chart is price pulled all the way to that breakout level. That breakout level, again, being established by the TD9 count level uh, uh, tool. And 41.6440 was that breakout level. So price hit that. And now we've got price trading for week number three above this green oscillator and change line. When I get two closes either above resistance, which the green oscillator and change line was, or below support, to me that's a confirmation of what the market's intent is. So the weekly chart now says this wants to continue to move higher, but we want to monitor that uh, this week and obviously for the following weeks. When I take a look at a daily time frame chart for the S&P 500, a couple of days ago it formed a TD9 count top. And this little oscillator and change line, when it changes color, in this case here it went from red to green, what we typically see is price and that line catch up to each other. So several hours ago that was price about 4507. I'm still anticipating that to be the move. The only thing that would change that is to take out the high from about four trading sessions ago. So that'd be number four reason. When I take a look at the charts here for the ES Mini as well as the S&P, so at the top I've got the S&P charts that we looked at. We've got the same patterns going on inside of the ES Mini. The nice thing about the ES Mini is it provides us with profile levels, which, are, which provide us with additional support or resistance areas. Another element to add to the bearishness is the stock market does not like war, and meaningful bottoms typically do not form until there's some type of uh, sense of an optimistic outcome. And this is uh, showing the uh, World War II cycle, but we can go through every single war cycle, and it really does the same thing. So that's another reason to be concerned, or that would be add to the bearish case for the market. Now, Another item, and I'm going to switch gears here. We're going to go from the S&P Basel to the NDX 100, which is the bottom portion of the screen. And I was turned on to this by one of our uh, guys in the uh, Tiger's Den, John from, uh, from Philly, who I believe got it from a uh, guest of, uh, of Larry Pesaventos. And that individual was suggesting that the, uh, that the NDX 100 might follow along the top that formed in the Nikkei 225 back in 1990. So what I do is I reprogram my system so that the, and the NDX 100 topped on November 22nd. I believe it was January 5th uh, for the ND, uh, for the uh, for the uh, Nikkei. So I right off both the, after the long weekend, the New Year's weekend, I remember it very well because I also had a peak E, I believe, in my NDX in my Nikkei chart. Yes. Uh, perfect, perfect. So so what I've got here, so it had your peak E. Uh, both the, both of these topped with the Rhodes momentum indicators signal. So this is updated in essence through today. Of course, the NDX 100 is still running right now, so it's not exactly priced exactly right. But you can see that the analog or the parallel is uh, is very striking. If this analog were to continue, and so here now I've just gone to a little graphic chart that I've created inside of an Excel uh, spreadsheet out here. And so, so you can see how it's following along very well here. Very so if well, this, yes. Yeah, if this analog is to continue, uh, this says that we've got another major down leg. Now, from a timing standpoint, if we're to continue, it equates to about the early part of June out here. Um, so we'll want to keep track of this as well. So those are all of the reasons to have a bearish case out there. But we always have to look at both sides of the trade. And so the bullish case for the stock market goes like this. First, 
interest rates are rising and should continue to rise for the foreseeable future. I don't think there's anybody that thinks otherwise. Now, many people, I hear a lot of media folks out there that say, this is the reason that the stock market should go down. But those folks don't really take a look at charts or history. Here's 30 years worth of history. The top portion of this chart, and I'm using for interest rate rising just the 13 month uh, or 13 week uh, T bill out here. And so you've got the rates rising. Those are the green arrows going to the upside. When you start taking a look at the S&P chart below, you also see that the S&P 500 uh, uh, moves higher during those time periods. So that's a case for the bulls, not the bears. It's essentially implying that money, the huge amount of money, people don't realize just how much is in bonds. When that starts to come out, it has to find a place to go. So that's another reason why you could see some money filtering to the stock market. Absolutely. And the, the, and the most important thing that really I want folks to understand is that rates rising Again, if you come back, now this is a monthly chart, so you get knee-jerk reactions out there. So I'm not talking about the one-day, two-day, but overall, if we take a look at over the last 30 years, when interest rates rise, so too does the S&P 500. Another reason to be bullish, now I showed the war chart there, Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. And oddly enough, or maybe it's not oddly enough, the actual bottom inside the S&P 500 took place on February 24th. So it's doing the exact opposite of what we would typically see in our war-based charts. So that's a reason to say, well, maybe what we really have going on here, what the market senses, is, is this is more of a geopolitical type event. And typically those bottoms from a geopolitical event standpoint happen the day that that event actually takes place out there. So a reason to consider the bullish side. Now, when markets make major tops, uh, Basil, you know that I take a look at instruments priced in the major currencies, those major currencies being euros, yen, and pounds. So on the left-hand side of the chart, we've got the Dow priced in dollars, next to that priced in euros, next to that priced in yen, and next to that pounds. Now, when markets make major tops, what we'll typically see is they will all make a high on the same day. Well, because we're dealing with Europe, we're dealing with uh, Japan, uh, here you've got tops that took place on January 5th inside the U.S. market. And then inside the Dow price in euros, that took place on January 4th, as it did for the yen, as it did for the pound. However, when we take a look at what has transpired since that top, we can see that priced in yen, the Dow made a higher high. So that says, that says, because we don't have everything lined up here, that what the Dow price in yen is telling us is we should expect to see a move higher. When I look at the weekly chart for the S&P 500, which we did before, prices above that green oscillator and change line. The oscillator and change line tells us that we have a rising price oscillator above zero for the weekly time frame. Basil, and that is a bullish condition out there. And also, lastly, prices trading above the top of the profiles for the ES Mini for the weekly basis. That, too, says that these are bullish conditions. So we've got it for the bulls and the bears out there. So I really appreciate it. You do fantastic work. Folks, go to the front page of TFN and check out Mastering Probability with, with Steve Rhodes. He does some fantastic work. I'll talk about the TD9 when we're off. There. Uh, and I